and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, two sessions as China's top policymakers wrap up their annual meetings. We take a look at the potential impact of those discussions. And we sit down with one of the original architects of China's capital market, Gao Xiqing. He reflects on his extraordinary part in the country's opening up and offers invaluable advice on how to navigate ongoing economic risks. We begin today's show with the political season in the Chinese capital. The National People's Congress has closed the meeting of its annual session. Chinese lawmakers passed nine documents, including the 13th five-year plan for economic and social development. During the so-called two sessions, China's growth concerns were under a global spotlight. The country's economy grew rapidly for more than three decades, lifting millions out of poverty and transforming the country from an agricultural-based nation to an industrial one. However, structural problems have become evident. Today, we focus on the Chinese economy amidst concerns and questions about the country's financial risks. Questions about China's economic future. At Premier Li Keqiang's annual press conference at the close of the two sessions, he expressed confidence in the Chinese economy. We have full confidence in the long-term prosperity of China's economy, and such confidence is not without foundation, since we believe that China's economy would not suffer a hard landing as long as we stick to the policy of reform and opening up. And since the Chinese market still has great potential, the government has set this year's target GDP growth between 6.5 and 7 percent. This is the first time in 20 years that China's GDP target has been set as a flexible range. Experts are interpreting the move as a signal that the country is more focused on quality rather than specific figures. But some doubt that even 6.5 percent can be achieved, as the country is facing a period of slow growth. It's impossible for me to agree that China is unable to meet its set growth targets. China's economy is facing difficulties and promises simultaneously. And judging from its base and the general trend, there are more promises than difficulties. Concerns have been swirling about the stock market since it experienced unprecedented volatility last summer. Li has pledged more measures to reform the financial markets and increase the use of Chinese currency. The stock market, the bond market, and the currency market are all market entities. So we will continue to pursue market-oriented reform and establish a sound legal framework for the operation of these markets. The government has the regulatory obligation and still needs to improve our regulatory system. First of all, by extending the coverage of regulation to all financial products. 2016 is only the beginning of the 13th five-year plan, and the country has ambitious goals. Besides doubling the GDP of 2010, China's long-term goals include eliminating poverty, providing internet access for everyone, building a well-off society in all respects, and raising Chinese life expectancy by one year. Challenges lie ahead. And effective measures will be needed. For more discussion on the Chinese Premier's annual press conference and many of the top policy points he touched on during those conferences, I'm joined here in the Beijing studio by two panelists from China. First of all, Professor Zhu Ning, who's the deputy director of the Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Welcome, Professor, to join us here in Beijing. And also joining us in the Beijing studio, Professor Liu Baocheng, who is the dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and Economics. Welcome, Professor. Mr. Liu, and joining us from Washington D.C., we have Mr. Douglas Paul, who is the Vice President for Studies and Director of Asia Program with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Mr. Paul, welcome as well. A lot of messages coming from the annual press conference by the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. Of course, the strong focus is on the economy. In the United States, there's a culture called、uh, "Is the economy stupid?" as in the campaign, and in China, it's also true now these days with the changes of the growth rate.、Uh, Professor Zhu, one of the things about the economy is when it's experiencing 
structural reform. What would that mean for social stability, particularly the employment opportunities, such as coal and iron and steel? Professor, did the Premier give some message? Yes, I, I think, I think uh, the, the Premier has uh, sent a very clear message about, well, first of all, I think as the experience in uh, the global economy, structural reform is always challenging and uh, difficult to undertake. So I think that is a very challenging task that Chinese uh, government is uh, taking over right now. Uh, the second thing is, I think, I mean, uh, one particular message I think that the Premier was sent in today's press conference is, well, I think China is quite committed to making that structural reform despite the short-term headwind or uh, challenges. Mm. So I think in particular in the area of uh, iron and steel or the, the coal mine, I think, uh, well, the, the, the government did, I think, a few preparations. One is what well, they set aside a certain fund for uh, helping the employees in those areas to make the transition. Mm. The second is I think that the government is willing to uh, forsake some of the short-term growth goals uh, in order to facilitate or encourage this transition. And lastly, I think I mean, related to the financial sector, it is trying to use more inno innovative financial instruments and financial engineering to help uh, uh, reduce the risk uh, tied to those risk, uh, to those areas. I see. We're going to talk about the financial sector a bit later. Let's just focus on these two areas, iron and steel and coal. You see not only economic news related to that, but also political news about China these days related to that. Uh, Professor Liu, 100 billion RMB, that is the fund that Professor Zhu earlier talked about that the Chinese Premier briefed the uh, public here in China. Chinese government set aside for re-employment of uh, uh, the laid off, if possible, laid off workers of these areas. But how is it likely to be allocated? How is going to be the central government's role playing vis-a-vis -vis local government and the SOEs or even private sector, this is still unknown. I think the, the message is now clear on, uh, in one part that the money will be uh, provided to the individual workers that are being laid off mm. instead of to those zombie, zombie enterprises uh, because otherwise they will uh, you know, uh, use it to produce more excessive capacity. And uh, the money will be channeled to transfer their job skill primarily. And uh, of training course, and stuff. Yeah, uh, for the uh, uh, job training and uh, uh, knowledge upgrading, and uh, uh, also you know reallocation. Uh, so the uh, uh, that is clear. But uh, what is not really clear is that uh, how are we going to deal with zombie enterprises, and are we going to uh, resort more to the bankruptcy law, or are we? Uh, still resorting to the old-fashioned administrative means by the uh, uh, mandatory merger and acquisition between uh, two uh, or more uh, state-owned enterprises. Mm. So that can really camouflage the, the issue, uh, but only for a short while. Right. Well, you know very well, at the government work report, Professor Liu, the Chinese Premier was specifically talking about what to do with some of the state sector that are having overcapacity. He's talking more about the merger and acquisitions as in the way to avoid bankruptcy, which would have a very negative effect on the individuals working for these companies. But will that work? Uh, let me go to uh, Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul, this is not just the industry that we are talking about. This is an interesting experiment, an important experiment, about how China is struggling with three important tasks all at the same time, growth, social stability, and structural reform. How do you think China is doing so far? The Premier's remedy work? Well, we'll have to see whether it'll work, but I think it's a really positive indication for China that you have Professor Liu and Professor Zhu um, directly addressing the concerns that are held around the world by people who watch the Chinese economy. economy. Um, these, this is a transition that other developing economies have gone through when they reached a high state of industrialization, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, others. And it's a very important transition. The good news is that people like Professor Leon and many in the State Council understand how challenging this will be. Mm. Um, we really need to uh, help China understand that mergers and acquisitions, the continued taking on of bad debt by banks uh, in order to create these large conglomerates, uh, is the path that Japan went down unproductively for quite a while 
and they had to go through a wrenching reform that caused a lot of slow growth. Hopefully the guidance that came out of last December's economic work conference and now the details contained in this new five-year plan uh, will give a, a road map to people to make the decisions to proceed with a larger number of bankruptcies than the special interests who control them will want to see right. and at the same time provide the means to uh, alleviate the social effects of the bankruptcies and downsizing of excess capacity. Mm. So yeah. another, can I add, add one, one more point? Another vicious uh, warning I really uh, uh, signed I could see is that uh, again we shift more of the debt into equity. So uh, uh, because that really doesn't really create liquidity and that can really, uh, you know, simply uh, shifting the problem from the, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, debtor into the creditor. So uh, that can really cover the problem for a while, but that's not really a sustainable so solution. So what about a sustainable solution? Let's talk about some of the possibilities. First of all, technology. I think this is a, a everybody agree technology could transform the industry, but how fast, to what extent will that be able to catch up with the speed of change that we have seen already in a society? Professor Zhu, in China's private sector, there are a lot of availability of technologies these yep. days even about the iron and steel and also the coal industry. Yeah. Whether it's clean coal or alternative energies, these yeah. are all possible. But of course, the price of it is a yes. big question mark, yes. especially in the, not necessarily uh, the most wonderful time of the economy. Right. And secondly, what about its competitiveness internationally, Professor? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, surprisingly, I think China has emerged as not only a just simple made in China cheap manufacturer uh, hotbed anymore. I think uh, many of Chinese uh, internet companies or high tech companies, for example, the I think one of the flagships like the drone company that's uh, uh, mm -hmm. coming out of uh, Shenzhen. I think China is now leading the world uh, in many cutting edge technology mm -hmm. or application of technology these days. So I think there's a lot of potential to be achieved or, or a lot of potential to be uh, unleashed in the uh, technology and technology related new business model uh, type of entrepreneurship. So I think that is a very promising area. Uh, the, the question I think as you have uh, proposed is well, whether that will be fast enough or that will be big enough. Efficient enough also. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I mean that really depends on. Uh, uh, I think one topic that Mr. Paul touched upon, productivity. I mean, I think it's a little bit uh, a race between I think the SOEs and the private enterprises in terms of okay whether they can get the uh, financing that they need, whether they can get the resources they can mm -hmm. have, whether they can access the market which are allowed to enter. So I think this is all falling back to the fundamental question about well where do we draw the boundary between the state and the market. So I think right. that is going to be going to be one key area of reform for Chinese uh, economy in the next five year plan. Mm. Uh, Mr. Paul, you probably have already noticed even from Washington that the Chinese President Xi Jinping at the very, very beginning of this year's two sessions, he participated in a joint group discussion with economists and also with some of the most well-known entrepreneurs, even private entrepreneurs in China, talking about the role of non-state sector in, in China. He's talking about the complementary role between the state sector and the non-state sector and calling on various level of government to uh, contribute and support the non-state sector as he indicated earlier several months ago. But uh, Mr. Paul, uh, when it comes to crucial points and time like this, when it comes to crucial points of employment, social stability, how do you see China is likely to proceed, Mr. Paul? Well, you're going to have um, uh unemployment in pockets. Uh, the northeast and uh, down in, uh, in the Guangzhou area will see higher unemployment as there's a tr tremendous shift in the industries uh, to higher tech capabilities and therefore more robotics and, fewer, and less hand labor. And uh, that's going to need localized attention. And this is, the, this is the great challenge in China. How do you take central uh, decisions and assets and deploy them effectively at the local levels where the problems are. And uh, you know, this incentive at the local level to resist change and to try to keep things as they are is very strong and it's got a deep history in Chinese uh, culture. So it's, it's going to be uh, very important. I, one of the things I, I worry about was the conversation with President Xi's uh, and, the, 
and the uh, entrepreneurs is there seems to be a feeling reflected in the guidance on state-owned enterprise ownership issued last autumn that somehow merging private sector and state sector is going to produce better results when in fact uh, our experience has been that you want to shrink the state sector to the absolute minimum necessary because you unleash so much more productivity and, and uh, 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 gains by uh, giving full reign to the private sector. Well, different economic, uh, political, and of course social situations, we seem to have various different uh, remedies toward what might be the solution. But one thing is very interesting, Professor Liu, what uh, Mr. Paul uh, just uh, mentioned, that, that is uh, what about the speed and the efficiency of some of the practices we are thinking about. Of course, China's economic scale and the base of China's economic foundation is nothing can be resembled elsewhere in the world. So China has to figure out a way of its own. Having said that though, Professor, what about innovation? Innovation, we talk about two parts. One is about innovation within even some of the already existing overcapacity industries. Iron and steel and coal, they could also have new technologies to upgrade the traditional industry. And second is the innovation that can really bring us some very different landscape of industries for the future, uh, which Professor Zhu earlier touched on. So which area do you think China should really focus its attention on? Can we really do things at the same time? Well, actually, by all responsible economists, you know, innovation uh, does not only mean technological mm -hmm. improvement. Uh, without institutional uh, environment, innovation will not sustain. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's number one. Number two, without a uh, big consumption power, innovation cannot be su uh, supported to commercialize. Mm. So therefore, uh, there, sh there should be you know, a, a two-wheel wagon. So the uh, uh, system innovation and also technological innovation. And for China, I think the breakthrough can be, of course, you know, we identified the uh, uh, internet related areas like uh, cloud computing, mm. et cetera. But I AI, think more AI, which yeah, is also AI, interesting. Uh, but more fundamentally, I think you know, China will generally upgrade its te uh, technology and uh, the uh, process of uh, uh, you know, mass production, because after all, China will have to still rely on its, uh, uh, the next phase of industrial uh, upgrading. So this is really the pillar for China. So yes, we talk too much about Internet Plus, we talk too much about e-commerce, <laughs> but real economy, well, actually, that's really the uh, emphasis mm. attached by Premier Li during the uh, press conference. Yes, real indeed, economy at the very beginning. will work really well, uh, he, at the very beginning, Premier Li touched on that once and again. He is suggesting, of course, he's answering questions related to financial risk. He's saying all the financial institutions and the work and the innovation they are doing is to eventually support right. the real, the real economy. economy. Right. That is a message being hammered once and again at the very yeah. beginning of press conference. Professor Zhu, what is your thought? Previously, we mentioned about the technological part, but what about the systematic approach? Uh, Premier uh, already talked about the deregulation. Yeah. But he's talking about the state council level. What about the local level? What about some of the other departmental organizations? Yeah, I think going back to your earlier question, I think, I mean, how to innovate, I think this is a key to Chinese economy going forward in the next decade. And I think the, the recently uh, uh, debated or the recently uh, proposed uh, uh, supply side reform, I mean, that is a structural reform that is going to propel innovation or propel the right kind of supply to try to use the good supply to replace the bad supply or the mm -hmm. overcapacity. But then I think the question is, well, the, 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 the market put supply versus the government push the supply. Hmm. So I think, I think that point. is a very delicate balance you would have to strike. Yes, government is more forceful and more, uh, I think, expedient, but it's probably less efficient as a private sector or the market force. So I think that is a trade-off the government would have to be uh, striking between the short-term and the medium to long-term mm. object, uh, objectives. And then coming back to the financial sectors, I think it is, it is a very, I mean, again, it is a very, very delicate balance because uh, 
across the world, you have the financing sector on one hand prope propelling the economy, on the other hand, from time to time becoming a very big systematic risk and uh, begging to be bailed out and requesting a lot of resources from the mm. government. So I think that is a very big lesson that China would have to learn and learn very carefully. Mm. Learn from the Japan's experience, learn from the U.S. experience in the past uh, a decade or so. So I think the, 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 the deregulation is per se a good thing. But in the area of finance, it is very important to keep in mind finance is such a special field that too big to fail is always something that we have to keep in mind. If we deregulate uh, on a massive scale as if in mm. the example of internet financing, we might have pockets of risks coming up and right. that is going to cause social stability. So going back to that, three challenges we have to manage at the same time. It is so exactly the regulatory challenges, isn't it? And it how is. fast and efficient yeah. these challenges yeah. are likely to be handled. Back to you, Professor, uh, Mr. Paul, uh, because we talk about this challenge, how to balance the market as well as the uh, state or the government, that's almost like a poem, very abstract. But when it comes to real policies, you have to write a very long prose as to how is that going to be handled. So far, do you think there's any inspiration from the Chinese side in writing the prose? Well, I think that the, as we get closer to the 19th Party Congress, a lot of these uh, political calls about where to put the emphasis on, on reform or innovation, of structural reform or innovation on uh, traditional industries or private sector. Uh, there are going to be political calls at the national and local levels repeatedly. And this is where the wisdom of China's leaders will be tested as they try to find how much you can do at one time and still not uh, create disruptive elements. Mm. I, I, I would like to emphasize what Professor Ju started to discuss, which is the very tricky element of managing the financial side of this. Uh, as of now, the Chinese financial sector, services sector, is growing dramatically. It is now a larger share of the economy in China than the financial sector was on the eve of the great financial crisis in the United States. This is a warning sign. It shows that there's a lot of accumulated debt that's being managed and rolled over. The uh, repression of incomes for people who are savers has permitted people to uh, lend to each other at very low rates. And, that's the and people go into lending because they can make some return. Uh, this has got to be brought back to size. That's a huge challenge mm. for China's regulators, as, uh, as you'll discuss probably later with uh, Mr. Gao Xiqing. This is a, uh, uh, one of the really tricky things ahead for China's leadership as it tries to strike all these various balances between reform and politics. Mm. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang at the annual press conference, Professor Liu, he did mention what he considered as the way out, at least for now, uh, which is to establish the regulatory landscape throughout the financial services, uh, including about all of those quote unquote innovative financial products. And yet he did admit it takes time to get all of these landscapes settled down and appropriate uh, legislations and uh, regulations. Uh, so he talked about, Professor Liu, the role of local governments as well as uh, central government relevant uh, uh, departments and organizations, their responsibility specifically talk about two words, responsibility vis-a-vis -vis power. But that is once again uh, putting these organizations and this level of governments on a very tricky ground because they have to figure out what their specific roles could be. I think regulators need to be regulated and also they <laughs> need to be educated before they can make the right uh, type of regulation. Uh, that's uh, number Well, one. they probably yeah. also uh, have to be self-educated and self-regulated so, at the same well, time. Well, look at the uh, uh, last year's uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, stock turmoil. The, you know, regulators came with very good intention, but we didn't work with circuit breaker and with all these uh, was, uh, measures. So side effects is still being felt today. Uh, so that's number one. That we really need professionals to handle this issue. And uh, number two is that, you know, eventually it is really the market that has a say, it's not the unilateral witch of the government because mm. the uh, as Chinese, uh, the financial market is going more sophisticated, government, a capricious hand 
won't really control the situation. Uh, well, uh, Despite control, all the confidence we have uh, manifested. Yes, indeed. Uh, control is not the word that we want to use and would like to see in the future, but how to balance it. You know, at certain times, the government believes it should come in because critical times, social stability, and also real economy. At other times, they can sit back and think about regulations rather than a real visible hand all the time on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, Professor Zhu, it is no secret. Mr. Liu Shu, Liu Shu already mentioned the head of the new head of the CSRC, CSRC. that uh, circuit breaker didn't work. The intention was good, but didn't work. Yep. And but the question is, what about in the future? Uh, what kind of balance has to be kept? And will the regulators be able to figure it out? Yeah, I, I think uh, the uh, very famous economist uh, uh, Milton Friedman once said that well, people often make the mistake of judging a policy by its intention, not by its consequence. So the problem is, I think, uh, the incentive system. I think we have to sort out the incentive of the regulators or the local governments. Mm. For the local governments, well, they want to grow their economy as fast as they can. And both politically and economically, they want to have a bigger budget to work with. <laughs> but then that is going to accumulate systematic risk at the national level, which is the regulator's burden or responsibility. Mm. So that is where we have the tension. So I think in the future, in, in the near future, I think fiscal reform is very important. How to allocate the resources between the local governments and the central government. And also, well, if you give local government a sort of a limited resources to work with, right. then maybe you would have to rely more on the real estate, which is like a big center of of risks. Well, gentlemen, just look at our conversation over the past 20 minutes. With one simple question about employment, we have already pulled out a whole string of issues that the Chinese government and the society need to handle all at the same time. Certainly mind-boggling, but this is also could be the opportunity, as the Premier said. The risks and the opportunity coexist at the same time. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Zhu Ning, Liu Baocheng, and Douglas Paul. Really appreciate gentlemen for being with us. Thanks. Stay with us here on World Inside. We've got our final segment coming right up. We sit down with one of the original architects of China's capital market, Gao Xicheng. He reflects on his extraordinary part in the country's opening up and offers invaluable advice on how to navigate the ongoing economic risks. You're watching World Inside on CCTV News. I'm Tian Wei. Life is like riding a bicycle. In order to keep the balance, you always have to move. That is at least a quote from the late Albert Einstein, one of the world's greatest minds. Life is not rocket science, however. It takes both intellect and courage to keep on moving and experimenting with new things, like the stock market in China, which didn't exist after 1949 until Gao Xiqing, this gentleman over there, came back to China from the U.S. with a couple of other young Chinese intellectuals. Now, as the world watches China's capital market for signs of its economic direction, especially after last year's stock market turbulence, it is extremely important, many believe, for China to look back at why the country's capital markets were created to begin with and figure out the best way forward. I spoke with Gao Xiqing in an exclusive interview on the sidelines of the annual political season in Beijing. Before we get to the details, let's get to know him a little bit more. Gao Xiqing was one of the key architects of Chinese securities law, but his beginnings were humble. In his teens, he labored on a railroad and even worked in an artillery factory. He was later selected as one of a small group of young Chinese sent to the U.S. to be educated in the 1980s, attending Duke University's law school as a Richard Nixon scholar. After graduating in 1986, Gao went to work as an associate on Wall Street at Nixon's former law firm Mudge Rose Guthrie Alexander in Ferdin. He returned to China in 1988 and helped establish the country's first securities markets, including the equity exchanges in Shanghai and Shenzhen, despite the significant challenge of persuading the policymakers of the day. Gao was twice vice chairman of China's Security Regulatory Commission and took the helm as founding president of China Investment Corporation, China's biggest sovereign fund, in 2007. Although he retired in 2014, the Chinese stock market remains among his biggest interests. 
Back in the year 1988, when you came back to China, try to establish the first security market in China. The weather at that time was so much better. <laughs> if you count the license plate, there were less than 100,000 cars. Mm. What a wonderful time. Policy makers of the time were sitting there listening to, quote unquote, these young guys talking about their dream. How did it happen? Some of the people who are still very important in the government, and they, at the time, they already were looking at these things. Only that they didn't have enough technical background to really understand how to actually implement it. Exactly what did you say at, that, at those meetings? We, we knew we needed to understand China's situation first. We would say, well, we understand that the financial uh, reform is going on, and we understand that our you know, market has all these benefits from the original ideas and the benefits from the reform. However, we also understand there are problems. For instance, the whole financing system for Chinese manufacturing industry was very lopsided mm -hmm. and also that was the time was right after about a year after the general inflationary scare of the whole country in 1987 inflation you know all this right 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 through China and everyone was scared and the government was very very alarmed so we said well why would that happen think about it was a reform with the increased income and everything People were, people were ready to buy things, to invest in something, but there's no place to go. So we say, well, if we have a new route where we can have people's savings into that sort of thing, because at that time, the only savings were all in banks. Mm -hmm. And you know, commercial banks cannot stop people from taking their deposit out. But we say, well, we would like, this is, these are, they call it the tiger that will ruin everything. We say, now we have, in, we have designed this cage for the tiger with a lock on it. Mm -hmm. you know, your cage right now is only the commercial banking and with a deposit system. That cage, you can never lock it. Because once you lock it, the tiger will never go in, right? But now we have a, a cage where the tiger will readily go in. Once it goes in, it turns one way and it will never come out. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's a stock market. You can only buy it, you can sell it to other people, but you can't just you know, get all the money out of the whole manufacturing system. Right. And that moved the uh, thinking of a lot of people. I said, oh, this is a great idea. And also, another thing was at the time, the, the central government and all the, also the economic circle were agonizing over this one problem that central government and local governments in China well, how to distribute their own, you know, respective powers, how to, to their, um, uh, distribute their, their own tax income and all these things. And this, of course, is a big problem for every major country. Mm -hmm. But for China and Taiwan, there was only one way to do it. That's, you know, the central government ordering everyone to do it. And but it, by ordering local governments, the central government will have to give something. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult for them to figure that out. And we said, well, if you start this, if you think about it, the most assets in China at the time were state-owned. And if you start with what we call stock, stock education, it's a coin word, meaning we take these companies public, make them a stock market, and then immediately you can divide these companies into infinite number of smaller equal value shares. Mm -hmm. And then you distribute them between the central government and local government, so easy. 1989, March, 500,000 yuan <laughs> by several companies, right? Citic, Everbright, China Venture Tech, eventually helped. Each was 500,000, so together it's 4.5 million. Oh, impressive then, yeah. okay. At the time, we, you know, we, we were quite excited because, because you know, um, after a considerable amount of uh, working on our own, finally we got some support. Not only support from the political side, but also support from the economic side. So we had some money. We could, you know, we, I stopped uh, draining my own savings. In fact, when I came back from the U.S., I put all my savings into my pocket. You left China with $17. When you came back, how much you have? I had 10,000 U.S. dollars in my pocket, cash. <laughs> I came back, I changed that 10,000 into RMB mm -hmm. at oh, the black market rate. Yeah. <laughs> at the rate, right. And I used most of that money to print, you know, at that time, each page of document, A4 paper, would cost 50 cents, wow. you know, 五毛钱. Yeah. 
And we, we you know. So you we got were, this very thick document and yeah. printed out for everybody for reference. For everyone to tell people, and I had to, you know, just at the, um, at the, in the, um, um, the Shijia Hu Tong, at the beginning the of Shijia. Oh. Yeah, we would go there and get those things printed out one by one. And just, I just saw my savings going <laughs> like that. <laughs> All going <laughs> right, right. to the printer shop. Right, yeah. and then I'll use that money also to take all the um, people who later join us, take them to, to you know, lunches, dinners, and try to persuade them to join us. And Nothing we succeeded. Nothing extravagant, I guess, uh, because that's No, we had a fried really yang rou, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Hao pao, that's it. Right, right. Uh, but, we, but many people remember that. Mongolian <laughs> hard pot. <laughs> Over the past 35 years, China's economy has achieved extraordinary growth thanks to its market-oriented reforms and opening up. By the end of 2012, China became the second largest economy by GDP size just after the U.S. But concerns have been swirling about the health of China's economy, which expanded at its slowest pace in 25 years in 2015. China suffered hundreds of billions of dollars in losses in the 2007 stock market crash. And last year's $5 trillion stock market bust resulted in an unprecedented government rescue that reverberated around the world. But with the recent appointment of new securities regulator head Liu Shiyu and new reforms, China is gradually restoring investor confidence. In a speech closing this year's two sessions, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said it would be impossible for China to fall short of its relatively high 2016 growth target of 6.5 to 7 percent, even as it pushes ahead with structural reforms. There have certainly been ups and downs for the Chinese economy, and managing the stock market remains a big challenge for regulators. You know, I was a regulator for many years. Right. Once I was, uh, became a regulator, and, I, and all of a sudden it's found, you know, all these problems coming to me, and there seemed, there seemed to be no answer to many of the things. But to me, the most important thing really was that, first of all, you've got, You've got to do what you've got to do. You know, you can't just say, "Okay, forget it. No, that's that's not not insolvable." No, I have to solve the problem. Secondly, there there's got to be you know some people coming in later and say, "Okay, you know, you 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 missed this, you missed that." I said, "Well, no, I tried. Mm -hmm. I tried very hard for it." Thirdly, this is probably more importantly, is that you cannot just depend on your own or on some academic model to do it. You have to try to use the wisdom of the masses, of the people, especially the wisdom of the, all the people, the stakeholders. I always try to get people together and try to get every, what we say, the big mouth, all getting in, invite them over, please you know, say something to us. Some of these people are very, very critical of us. Yeah, they, they would speak nasty words right in my face. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't mind. So long as you can come at it with something that's, you know, that, that's useful for the, for the uh, you know, betterment of the uh, overall system. But you know that sometimes people also say if you hear so many voices, you might be distracted. At the back of my mind, I always have certain things that I regard as sort of principle. Out of my own you know, desire to work purely for the system, for, for, the, uh, for the betterment of the system, and without any personal agenda. You have nothing to fear. Right. I'm not going to be f in favor of any particular interest group. You know, at the time, there were many different things. People say, well, we should support state-owned enterprises first. Mm -hmm. Or they say, well, we should su support uh, private enterprises first. I don't buy those things. I would say, OK, what I'm concerned with is a system that works for everyone. What do you make of what happened last year, some of the ups and downs, just as an academic? And how do you think, moving forward, solving the problems, as you are always eager to? As a people's delegate, I just submitted my proposal to the People's Congress. Um, what is it about? It's about the, to clarify the responsibilities and functionalities of the Securities Regulatory Agency. The other part, uh, the proposal to, to, um, to work out a, a post-crisis um, um, post-crisis method. I know you're trying to translate the Chinese into the English. Right. Um, of the, um, you know, of what happened during that uh, crisis period. Is it possible that market to play a decisive role? Well, you know, in, in economics there are all these debates over the past 200 years, you know, 300 years. And today we're still, you know, part of our government still believes in original Leninist or Stalinist even, you know, uh, central planning 
uh, way of doing things. That's why in many parts of our economy there are still all these heavy-handed central planning. But on the other hand, there are people who believe in you know, market functioning. But to, you know, with typical Chinese wisdom, you know, we, we say let the facts decide on you know, how we think. Then you look at the facts. You know, we've tried plan economy for so long, and especially my generation. You know, I've been through all these hugely you know, you know, scarcity period of time, and I was hungry for many years. That's why I eat so much every day today, you know. <laughs> Just <laughs> so, to make up for it. Right, right. And to the, we all know that you can not possibly go back to that period of time. At the same time, we also know that pure, total, laissez-faire market economy probably won't work either. Because we, 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 you know, we look at the U.S. economy, we look at the European economy, they are full of problems as well. They, you know, it's true that their economy now is you know, running sort of better than most other economies by the general level. And, but they, from time to time, they, you know, they, 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 we, we have what they say as market failure. When the market you know, starts to have major problems, then the, the system couldn't handle it, like what happened in 2008, right. when they, you know, the whole financial market to, was in general scare and people thought that the, you know, the capital system was going to crumble. But they came back. And their systems, are, you know, they, they have a, a system where we can, they can try to correct these problems and come back. Everyone has a different view. That's fine. But for us, I think the most important thing, really, is that we should, we should be realists, especially when running the government. We need to be honest with the market. We need to be open-minded, transparent, with the, with the general uh, populace. That's Gao Xiqing, an MPC deputy, talking to us on the sidelines of the two sessions which wrapped up today in Beijing. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Insight CCTV News into your search engine. You will be able to find us, or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Insight team, thanks for watching and tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.